Daniel chapter 8. And we're going to begin this morning in verse 1. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that had appeared to me earlier. I saw the vision, and as I watched, I was in the fortress city of Susa, in the province of Elam. I saw in the vision that I was beside the Ual Canal. I looked up, and there was a ram standing beside the canal. He had two horns. The two horns were long, but one was longer than the other. And the longer one came up last. I saw the ram charging to the west, the north, and the south. No animal could stand against him, and there was no rescue from his power. He did whatever he wanted and became great. As I was observing, a male goat appeared coming from the west across the surface of the entire earth without touching the ground. The goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and rushed at him with savage fury. I saw him approaching the ram, and infuriated with him, he struck the ram, shattering his two horns, and the ram was not strong enough to stand against him. The goat threw him to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat became very great, and when he became powerful, the large horn was shattered. Four conspicuous horns came up in its place, pointing toward the four winds of heaven. From one of them, a little horn emerged and grew extensively toward the south and the east and toward the beautiful land. It grew as high as the heavenly host, made some of the stars and some of the host fall to the earth and trampled them. It made itself great, even up to the prince of the host. It removed his daily sacrifice and overthrew the place of his sanctuary. Because of rebellion, a host, together with the daily sacrifice, will be given over. The horn will throw truth to the ground and will be successful in whatever it does. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the speaker, How long will the events of this vision last? The daily sacrifice to rebellion that makes desolate and the giving over of the sanctuary and of the host to be trampled. He said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored. In verse 12, because of rebellion, a host together with the daily sacrifice will be given over. The horn will throw truth to the ground and will be successful in whatever it does. Within two months of getting married, Gladys and I discovered that she was pregnant. It was an exciting and happy time. We called our friends and our family. We began making plans. Um, we were newly married, um, married a little later, a little older than some folks, and we were excited that we were going to soon have a baby at the house. Um, Gladys had worked at the seminary for 12 years before we married, so that all the old women she worked with were excited for her when we got married, and then were really excited when they found out she was pregnant. At the time, I was taking a Latin class and was at home studying for a final. Gladys had gone to work at the seminary bookstore and had only been gone a few hours when one of the women at the school called me. She said, Jean, Gladys has started hurting. And she called the doctor and they told her to come in. One of the ladies here is taking her to the doctor. You need to go to the doctor's office. I made my way quickly to the doctor's office. And just as I walked in the door, my nearly hysterical wife came out of the ladies' room crying and nearly screaming. I quickly grabbed her as she cried. I lost it. I lost it. The office staff quickly moved us into a room in the back. The doctor came in and examined her. It wasn't until a week later that we discovered that she had had a tubal pregnancy and her tube had ruptured. What was it that caused all the turmoil? 
What occurred that day that caused all of the excitement? Well, according to the Supreme Court, that day Gladys and I lost a group of cells, a fetus. A group of cells that the writers of our Constitution supposedly gave us the legal right to remove more than 200 years ago. That's what caused all the tears. We lost a few cells. No, my friend. What we saw that day and what we continue to see each day is what Daniel foretold centuries ago. That truth has been thrown to the ground. In the Garden of Eden, even before the fall, God told Adam and Eve to tend the garden. Even before the fall, He had work for them to do. In the Ten Commandments, He commands us, Six days shalt thou labor. Evidently, He intended for us to be productively employed or engaged or serving a large part of our time. God never intended us to sit around and watch TV all the time. He never intended us to sit around and live off of savings accounts, doing nothing, accomplishing nothing, wasting our time instead of investing it and using it. The time that He's given us here on earth. Paul even told us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. And yet many have made leisure the primary goal, and it is killing us. Parents work all day and then come home and pick up behind choreless children who are waiting for their exhausted parents to cart them here and there. So we're an ungrateful generation of folks who do not know how to work, but who want everything and end up marching, protesting, and burning because they cannot have at 22 years old what their parents have spent a lifetime working and accumulating. Visit many of the Indian reservations in our country, places where the residents are guaranteed thousands of dollars of unearned money per month taken in from casinos were promised by the federal government out of guilt for past sins against these folks. On most of these reservations, in spite of the large amount of money poured in, you will find large numbers of people unemployed or addicted to one substance or another. Why work when it's given to us? So they drink and drug themselves through another day, waiting for the next check to come in. And truth is thrown to the ground. In spite of the fact that biology clearly shows that in the beginning God created them male and female. In spite of the fact that our eyes clearly tell us God made them male and female. Many in our society now claim a person can be whatever they want. A lawsuit has been introduced against the Volusia County School Board by a teenage student who feels unfairly discriminated against because this transgender student is not allowed to use the locker room and restroom he wants but is required to use separate facilities. Truth has been thrown to the ground. When we see this fact being played out and more and more evidence given for it in our society and in our homes and our communities each day. Things that are blatantly clear. Things that have been clear and obvious to the generations of our parents and grandparents who have gone before us now in this society apparently no longer makes sense. How do God's people respond when we see this junk going on around us? When we see fabrication, lie, and falsehood taking the place of truth, how do we respond? Number one, you remember where this falsehood is coming from. In John chapter 8, verse 44, we are told you are the father of the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has not stood in the truth because there was no truth in him. When he tells a lie from his own nature, 
Because he is a liar and the father of lies. Look, lies and liars have been around from the very beginning. The devil came in in the Garden of Eden and began spouting lies. This is nothing new. It may be new to your experience and it may be new to mine. And it may not be what we are accustomed to, but it is nothing new. The devil is a liar and has been from the very beginning. My word, don't be surprised at this stuff. <coughs> Dishonesty and falsehood have been around since almost the beginning. And some of the folks around us are now ate up with this stuff. The devil's blinded them. And the people that we encounter, the vast majority of them don't even realize how blind they are. And how the devil has twisted and distorted their thinking. It's not these people that we're fighting against. It is the devil himself. Ephesians chapter 6 beginning in verse 11 we read, Put on the full armor of God so that you can make your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this world's darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground and having done everything to stand. Remember, my friends, that the battle we're fighting is not these stupid people we see on TV. They're merely blinded pawns of the prince of the power of the air. And by God, God has delivered them in the past and he can deliver these folks too. Remember who it is that's working behind the scenes. Remember where this falsehood is coming from. Second, remember none of this surprises the Lord. None of this is taking him by surprise. Turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the cravings of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served something created instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. That is why God delivered them over to degrading passions. For even their females exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The males in the same way always also left natural relations with females who were inflamed in their lust for one another. Males committed shameless acts with males and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty for their error. And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a worthless mind to do what is morally wrong. What do we do? You remember where the battle's coming from. And you remember none of this takes God by surprise. God did not wake up one morning wringing his hand and say, Woe is me, I don't know what I'm going to do now that this person has been elected. God didn't wake up one day wringing his hands and say, Well, I didn't see that coming. My friends, I want you to understand that our God is still on the throne. He knows the beginning to the end. There's no difference to him. He understands it all. And we get frustrated and discouraged because we did not see it coming. But God is still on the throne. And none of this has taken him by surprise. My word, it was centuries ago that the Lord had Daniel foretell this day when truth will be thrown to the ground. 
So don't go wringing your hands acting like God is surprised. You remember that God knew. And God is still on the throne. Third. We study God's word so we will know the truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 we are told. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. My word. You want to understand what is true in the world. And how to interact and how to respond to people. You won't be able to cut through the brush and to find the golden nuggets. You spend time in the word of God. Because there you will find the truth. What is right and what is wrong. And the passions going on behind what we see happening in our society today. And sadly in many of our homes. You spend time in the word of God so that when we encounter this junk, we'll be able to see through it all and understand what's going on. Study God's word. Don't let all of the feeding be done here. My word, you're starved to death. Go home. Spend time in the word of God yourself. Reading it. So that when people come to you at work, and they're struggling. The children are having trouble. They're having trouble with their marriage. You will be able to share with them from God's word yourself. You'll be able to share with them from the overflowing out of your own life. Study God's word. So that you will know and recognize the truth when you see it. Fourth, examine yourself. There in Romans chapter 1 where we left off, beginning in verse 29. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. My word. Examine yourself and make sure that you haven't allowed any of that rot into your life. Man. Notice some of the things that, that God has included in this. Disobedient to parents. Rebels. Gossips. He includes that here in all of the nastiness. Examine ourselves and make sure that we haven't let the devil get a foothold into our lives with any of this nasty nonsense. To sap our power and our strength. To dim our light. Or to steal our salt. Examine yourself. Fifth, make it a priority. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23 says, Buy the truth and sell it. Not buy the truth and sell it, uh, sell it not. Wisdom and instruction and understanding. Daniel made knowing the truth a priority in his life. When they passed a law in the land that you could not pray to anybody but the king, Daniel said, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to continue relating to and interacting with my heavenly father every day. He is the truth and the source of my truth. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, kill us if you want. But we will not bow out down to your statue. Make knowing the truth a priority in your life. Some laugh, Brother Jesus. How can I get to know God? How can I know him better? The Lord said, you will search for me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Man, don't play around the perimeter and play at church. And then complain that you're not being fed and you're not getting anything out of it. My friends, you're just kidding yourself. 
You will know God and you will know the truth when there's a passion and a priority in your life and in your heart. Make it a priority. Six. Teach the truth. Second Timothy chapter 2 beginning in verse 24 we read and the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth continue to share and to teach the truth and notice how it says that we are to do that it says with meekness. Oh man. The only reason I got, ever got on Facebook in the first place was uh, to do share some devotions. And um, anybody that wants to be my friend except for a couple scantily clad women inviting me to a website, if they send me a friend uh, invite, I accept it. Because I want to be able to interact with folks. I want to be able to share devotions and, and words and, and inspirational things. I'll accept it. And let me tell you, I, I, I have some, quote, friends on Facebook that got some twisted understanding. Some twisted thinking. There's one guy, there's not a, a, a liberal, ungodly thing possibly in society that he has not shared at one time or another on Facebook. And tells me that he is a homosexual Christian. And all I want to do is get on there and tell him how stupid and blind he is. Ate up with ignorance. But that's not the way Jesus did. And that's not how the Bible commands us to. It says that we're to teach those who oppose us with meekness. When that co-worker comes up to you, when that child comes up to you, Spewing that dishonest foolishness. Ask them a question. Jesus often asked questions. Ask them a question. Do you really think that there's no difference between men and women? No, people can do any, be anything they want to be. Then why are we having a women's march? Ask them questions. Allow them to see the, the fallacy of the things that they're supporting. And pray that God will open their eyes. Teach. Teach you those who oppose you. Man, easiest thing in the world. To get upset and to get angry. And begin to holler like they do. It's not the way that Jesus won the world. It's not the way the Christians in the first century impacted society. Jesus said by this and we all men know that you're my disciples. If you have love one for another. We share the truth. But we do it in a loving in a gentle way. Seventh. You stand firm. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn there with me, please. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Beginning of verse 13. Brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take note of that person. Don't associate with him so that he may be ashamed. Yet, don't treat my word. I'm at the wrong place here. Uh, I'm sorry. Verse 13, chapter 2. But we must always thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord. Because from the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught, either by our message or by our letter. When the world keeps swooning to try to dilute or dissuade 
or discourage you. Stand firm. Study the truth, know the truth, and stand on the truth. Don't compromise just to get along. Stand on the truth and do it in a loving way. But not only are we to stand firm, look there, continuing, verse 16. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica, what is he doing here? He is praying for those people. And we need to pray for one another. We need to pray that God will encourage us when we are at work. That he will give us the strength to stand for what is true and the restraint to do it in a loving way. We need to pray for one another that God will give us the strength not to, not to compromise the word of God. We need to pray for one another. Next, we need to worship. Oh, my friends, there's nothing that will change your heart and your attitude quite like worship. Paul and Silas sitting in a dungeon having just been beaten. Their backs were bloody. The jailer being told, be sure these boys don't get away. They took them into the inner dungeon and shackled their feet. Not only were they beaten and bruised, not only were they bleeding, they were locked in an inner dungeon. They could not even get comfortable for the position they were in with their feet shackled like they were. They could not even get up to go and use a bucket in the corner of the room to relieve themselves. And yet in the midst of that, they began to praise God. The Bible records that those in the prison began to listen. Because that's not the way that ordinary people in that dungeon, in that prison would respond. You see, my friends, when we begin to praise, we take our focus off of our problems and our issues and we begin to put our focus on the God who is above all the problems. And the God who is above all the issues. The God who knows the beginning from the end. The God who there in Daniel chapter 8 said that he's only going to get away with this for a set amount of time. And then I'm going to nip it in the bud. We are tempted to be discouraged and we begin to praise. We remember that above it all and in control of it all is the creator of it all. And that one day we will see that loving mighty Father again. When you're tempted to be overwhelmed, the truth seems to be falling to the ground. Worship. Praise. And my friends, I want you to remember also that in the days ahead, as we see more and more hurt, more folks fall away. And Christians, persecution increase. You and I have a choice in how we will respond. In his book, Man's Search for Me Meaning, Holocaust survivor Victor tells about his time as a Jew living in a Nazi POW camp. He said the Nazis took everything we Jews had. They took our property. They took our homes. They took our clothing. They took our pictures. They even took our names. Tattooed numbers on us and that is what we were to be identified with. But he said the one thing that they could not take, the freedom they could never steal was the freedom to choose how we would respond in that prison camp. And my friends, you have the choice to throw in the towel and to complain and to quit. 
or you have the option with truth on the ground of praising God the God that is still on the throne and still in control and of telling others of a God who loved them enough to send his son Jesus Christ.